is a culture of impunity, if we restrict ourselves merely to condemnations uh, which are easily forgotten, then we're never really going to be able to create uh, a culture in which the rule of law uh, prevails. In that respect, I would like to suggest further to what my uh, esteemed, uh, respected uh, friend and colleague Shadi Sadr has said, that as she said, the increasing demands for accountability are themselves part of the future Iran that is presently being built. The future Iran is already in the process of being built. And one of the unique features of what we see in Iran, which I think represents an unprecedented political maturity, is the connection between means and ends. The nonviolent nature uh, of the protest movement in Iran, which I would submit is really not about who won the elections, but much broader grassroots social movement that embraces in its fold an exceptionally broad cross-section of Iranian society, from feminists to student leaders to human rights activists to labor unions, um, even those who are de uh, devote uh, Shia uh, uh, Muslims, uh, those who are secularists, and that is really the strength uh, 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 of the movement. Uh, so the nature of this movement, its uh, uh, articulation of its demands for accountability, rule of law, transparency, um, bringing to the surface the truth which has been repressed about human rights violations, all of those are already the nucleus of the future uh, Iran, uh, which is in the process of being made. So in that context, we have to see our current efforts at documentation, whether it is the efforts of those very brave people who, uh, under very difficult circumstances, are trying to raise these issues uh, in Iran, or uh, uh, our efforts uh, abroad uh, in the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, which is necessary only because current circumstances don't allow for this sort of exercise to take place. You'll recall that after the protest violence in June, um, some of the reformist groups began some sort of process of documenting the violations that had taken place uh, and uh, were ultimately uh, prosecuted. Their offices were raided. The documents which they had in their possession were used by the intelligence services to actually find collaborators who were then uh, further arrested. So there's a reason why this exercise is taking place outside of Iran, uh, at least in the activities of our center. It's simply because circumstances are uh, not favorable to such an exercise in Iran. And it would be my hope, in a sense, that uh, our activities would eventually be repatriated, if you like, to Iran uh, at some point in the future. And if we look at the model, for example, of South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we see that it did not await the end of apartheid before it began its activities. Uh, the various anti-apartheid activists, uh, in collaboration with international civil society, were in the process of documenting these abuses long before the end of apartheid. And what was initially a non-governmental organization, an initiative of civil society, at the right point became transformed into an official Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, which began to uh, document these abuses and which became a central part of the post-apartheid transformation and the process of uh, national reconciliation. So we need to think about these initial efforts at documentation in the broader light of we are, in a sense, uh, setting the foundation uh, together with those that are struggling in Iran. Uh, we, civil society, outside of Iran are contributing to that process and setting a discourse and a foundation so that when circumstances change in Iran, uh, we will already have made significant process in the direction of promoting a culture of accountability. One of the problems when we think about the respective role of the international community and what's happening in Iran is the fact that human rights are ultimately not taken too seriously. And I'll explain what I mean. Of course, there are resolutions at the United Nations General Assembly which criticize and condemn Iran's human rights record. Um, and um, <coughs> both Rene Redman and I will be going to Geneva this weekend in anticipation next week of the consideration of Iran's human rights record 
by the UN Human Rights Council. These exercises are all important and no regime wishes to be condemned or stigmatized or isolated for human rights abuses. But at the end of the day, we have to demonstrate, as we hear in all of these uh, uh, the television uh, shows about uh, you know, cops and robbers, they tell us crime does not pay. So the message has to be at the end of the day that there is a cost attached to committing atrocities. And in this case, we have to say crimes against humanity does not pay. Human rights abuses are not merely a reflection of uh, sadism or some sort of uh, a primordial aggression. They are the deliberate use of violence and terror as an instrument of power. Uh, I've served with the United Nations in uh, places as diverse as the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Cambodia, and although each of those situations has its own unique circumstances, the story is always the same. There is nothing uh, uh, inherent about these uh, conflicts uh, which are ideological in their nature, whether they use religion or ethnicity uh, or some other justification for repression. At the end of the day, what we're dealing with is the use of uh, violence, torture, rape, murders, misinformation as an instrument of power. And the struggle of the international community and civil society has to be to change that cost-benefit calculus. And I have seen in the former Yugoslavia how the intervention of international criminal justice dramatically changed that cost-benefit calculus. Now, what is the main issue that the international community speaks about in relation to Iran? It's the nuclear issue. What we hear time and again is the nuclear issue is the central uh, uh, focus. Now, I don't intend to speak about the nuclear issue. That's not my subject of expertise. But what I do want to say is that the root of all problems in Iran, both for the people of Iran and for the international community, is the lack of accountability for human rights violations. It's the lack of a democratic culture. We do not worry about regimes that have nuclear capability when they are democratic in nature, when they're responsive to their people's real needs. And we have seen throughout history that a regime that uses mass violence as an instrument against its own people is more likely to project its violence abroad also through violence. So in that sense, the international community beyond the General Assembly resolutions and condemnations has to begin to make human rights the central parameter of its dealings with the regime uh, in Iran. One of the questions we have to ask ourselves, for example, is why does the UN Security Council adopt targeted sanctions which imposes uh, travel bans and asset freezes against individuals and companies involved in the nuclear program, but makes no such gesture with respect to those leaders that are responsible for widespread systematic human rights abuses? Why are those individuals not similarly subject to asset freezes and travel bans, even as a purely symbolic gesture to the democratic movement and human rights movement within Iran, that the international community stands with them and that they're willing to take seriously the question of impunity for human rights abuses. One of the questions we have to ask ourselves, further to what Shadi Sadr has told us, is how can we begin to move towards uh, a new paradigm in which accountability becomes an essential uh, ingredient of the transformation of Iran, uh, not simply a transformation which is a, a, a factional power struggle where one political <coughs> elite uh, with tyrannical uh, uh, attitudes re is replaced by another political faction with similarly tyrannical attitudes, one of the lessons of 1979. Um, uh, which, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, was the 31st um, anniversary of, of the revolution was uh, yesterday. It's an interesting coincidence that Iran's human rights record is being considered at the UN um, really uh, uh, on, on this, uh, at, at this time. But one of the lessons is that uh, genuine change is not simply about replacing one set of political elites with another set of political elites. It's about a grassroots transformation. It's about political maturation. It's about changing people's 
expectations and political consciousness. The great promise that the future of Iran has is because of those millions of people marching in the streets, demanding human rights, demanding justice, a sort of post-ideological, uh, broad-based movement uh, that uh, has a great power in the simplicity of its demands, that human rights be respected and that those responsible for abuses be brought to justice. It's in that context that we have to understand the importance of making accountability a central ingredient uh, of the transformation of Iran and of building a truly democratic culture. In that respect, there are many lessons to be learned from the experience of countries as diverse as South Africa um, and how it dealt with apartheid era crimes, uh, Argentina's attempts to deal with the crimes of the military junta during the dirty war, uh, the model of international criminal justice, which we saw in relation to the former <coughs> Yugoslavia, each of those has a, a lesson for the Iranian experience as civil society and the international community in partnership with the Iranian people begin to forge a different path for the future of that country. Shadi Sadr explained correctly that Iran is not a signatory to the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, and it's very obvious why Iran would not want to be signatory to that statute, because many of its leaders could end up uh, uh, with arrest warrants against them for conduct, uh, which um, by uh, many definitions could realistically amount to crimes against humanity, crimes within the subject matter jurisdiction of that court. But there's nothing to stop a future democratic Iranian government from signing the statute of the International Criminal Court. And if we had this discussion a year ago, when most people assumed uh, that there is really no civil society movement capable of challenging the hardliners, it may have seemed unrealistic, but today we can realistically speak about a new Iran within the foreseeable future. None of us can give an exact date, but what we see in Iran is a seismic shift which inevitably will bring, up, bring about change. The question is when and at what cost. The point is from now to begin to document those crimes, to make them a central ingredient of the discourse of the international community <coughs> in order to deter leaders who may be tempted now to escalate violence to the point of mass executions, which is a real possibility if the regime feels that its power is being subject to serious challenge. And we have seen from the experience of uh, 1988, uh, in, in which we witnessed uh, what I c consider in a parallel to Yugoslavia, uh, Iran's Srebrenica. As you know, Srebrenica in the Yugoslav war uh, symbolized uh, in one single mass execution of some 7,000 Bosnian Muslims the excesses of the war. Uh, although there were many executions in Iran, in 1988 when about 4,000 uh, leftist prisoners were systematically executed. That became really a symbol uh, of the excesses. And we have uh, among the reports of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center one of the most comprehensive accounts uh, of those events. And we see that all of the individuals that were uh, involved in that mass execution, this so-called death commission, uh, went on to be promoted, went on to become ministers and senior advisors, and many of them are still uh, part of the uh, Iranian regime. The, the point that I'm trying to uh, address here is that um, at some point consideration has to be given to how one can come to terms with such widespread and systematic criminality because it is simply not possible to prosecute each and every person that has been involved uh, in a 30-year long campaign uh, of massive atrocities. And that is one of the challenges uh, that Iranian society has to face, as on the one hand, it calls for accountability, but on the other hand, it has to facilitate a peaceful and nonviolent transition by giving those involved in the existing uh, uh, state and security apparatus really an incentive, an incentive to peacefully surrender power. One possible model is to create either um, an international criminal jurisdiction, perhaps by uh, um, uh, having a future government sign the statute of the International Criminal Court, 
and retroactively refer crimes uh, to that court, or possibly to have some sort of national trial within Iran, uh, which is credible, which has uh, perhaps the participation of the United Nations and other international elements, and to restrict prosecutions to those leaders that are most responsible for these atrocities. <coughs> that has been the model that we've seen in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda uh, and in many other cases where it's simply not possible to prosecute tens of thousands of people. And perhaps it's not even desirable in the name of healing and national reconciliation to do that. And at the end of the day, a criminal trial is not about the victims. It is about the accused. It is about the defendant. And one cannot, in a criminal trial, have tens of thousands of victims come and tell their stories. And that was the power, perhaps, of the African Truth and Reconciliation Commission model, which allowed a genuine process of national healing where tens of thousands of people who had lost their loved ones, who themselves had been tortured and abused, could come and have a vindication of their suffering, to be given some sort of public recognition to what had happened, and to allow that whole truth-telling process to counter the years of misinformation and propaganda and hate-mongering, which had twisted and distorted uh, the culture to one which was not compatible uh, with uh, human rights. So we have to begin this discussion um, which uh, Shadi Sad referred to, the future of Iran. We have to begin that discussion now. We have to start thinking about the different modalities and the complexities of uh, holding individuals accountable, perhaps in some cases through prosecutions, perhaps in other cases through amnesties in exchange for confessions uh, where there have been abuses. And the message is a very complex one because on the one hand, the message must be to the leaders that if they resort to mass executions and violence, that they will be held responsible, while perhaps the wider message to those that find themselves uh, uh, enlisted uh, in this uh, massive repression apparatus should be that it is also possible to have a country in which there will be uh, forgiveness, in which there will be reconciliation, and hopefully that possibility will create a further incentive for people to lay down their arms and allow for a peaceful transformation. So I want to once again thank you, all of you, uh, for your support uh, and to thank the great staff of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. Five years ago when the organization was established, this discussion that we're having today was seen as something uh, totally remote, unrealistic, and irrelevant. Uh, and it's particularly uh, heartwarming <coughs> for me to, to see today how far we have come um, and uh, how much further we have to go, but, but still how close we are now to perhaps realizing a uh, vision of uh, a different uh, Iran in which human rights are respected and in which uh, the rule of law prevails. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand here so that Shadi can see me. But any questions, any comments? OK, then I will ask both of you. Oh, I have one. Sorry, go ahead. Speak loudly, please. Sure. Is this on? You talked about a shift um, from documenting uh, in, to documenting human rights violations from simply kind of trying to get the word out. Uh, and I guess my question is, how common knowledge is it in Iran for the average citizen that these violations are occurring and um, that that they're not only violations of international law but of Iranian law? Sorry. Yeah, but I'm I'm I didn't hear the complete complete of the question because uh, especially the uh, um, the second part of it I didn't hear. Can I repeat it for her? Let me repeat it just so you can hear. Uh, her question is that she'd like to know how um, your average citizen and people inside of Iran how much are they aware of. How many? How much of these violations are they aware of? The human rights violations. Okay. 
um, in my opinion, um, we can two, uh, we, we can um, uh, divide uh, the uh, evolution of human rights discourse with uh, uh, two different uh, phases, two different uh, historical parts. The, the first one is before the uh, post-election event, and the, the, the second one is after that. Because I think uh, before the post-election events, um, human rights e was something uh, uh, related to human rights activists uh, um, and the uh, intellectuals, uh, high educated people, and people who were involved in uh, some uh, social movement uh, activities. Um, but after the election, when thousands, thousands, and millions of uh, persons, ordinary people, uh, who uh, had never uh, been faced with violation of rights uh, 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 in, during the, uh, uh, the uh, brutal uh, uh, violation of human rights after the election, they, uh, f f it was the first time that they faced with uh, human rights violations uh, and they, uh, uh, they uh, were targeted. They, they were the target of the human rights violation, they were victims, and they were just ordinary uh, persons. So I think the, the human rights discourse, and, and, and uh, especially after the election, the post-election events, the human rights discourse has a, uh, has a very, uh, uh, has a, a potentiality to, to move forward because, uh, because uh, a lot of people uh, became sensitive to human rights issues uh, m more than uh, before the election. And I think it's the time that human rights activists uh, uh, speak, out speak out louder about human rights violations, human rights discourses, and the necessity of accountability uh, uh, both within the judicial system and uh, and within the framework of Iran's judicial system and uh, within the international mechanisms. Um, f following on what uh, Shadi has said, uh, I think that w one of the dramatic changes after the protest violence is that what we knew for 30 years was going on behind closed doors in torture chambers of Evin prison and elsewhere has now spilled out into the street. <laughs> and I even had uh, students from Iran who were skeptical about, you know, when we talk about human rights violations, simply because they never heard of what's going on behind closed doors. And then they came to me after the summer and they said, now we believe everything that we, we hear because we saw with our own eyes, I don't know, well, women and elderly and people being uh, beaten violently simply because they were protesting peacefully. And one of the points further to what Shadi has said about, if you like, the popularization of human rights away from the hands of long-standing activists like Shadi and, and, and others, who uh, really for uh, many years were a very small and isolated community, and now they're part of a really uh, much wider social movement. One of the dimensions is the use of the media. And we have to uh, go back to 1989 and the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. Uh, where one of the key turning points is when police began beating a uh, number of young uh, peaceful protesters. And in 1989, communist Czechoslovakia, having a video camera itself was quite extraordinary. And someone videotaped this beating, and this videotape changed hands throughout Prague. And the image, the visual image of seeing the police beating these peaceful young people radicalized the population. And the, in the following days, hundreds of thousands of people poured out into the streets. And obviously, the most iconic image is Neda Agha Sultan, but there are many, many other images as well of people bleeding, people who've been shot and, and, and murdered in the streets. Uh, and I think that that is one of the, um, if, if we look at sort of the parallel with Czechoslovakia, uh, we see this magnified uh, a thousandfold because now everybody has a camera, everyone has a cell phone, everyone has access to YouTube and, and, and Twitter. So that effect of visualizing violence to people who are not human rights experts or activists, but who at the level of human beings can see people who are bloodied and beaten, um, I think has been one of the most important dimensions of delegitimizing uh, the, the, the regime and, 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 and making a link between 
legitimacy of political power and respect for human rights. Speak loudly. <laughs> hi. Um, hi. First of all, my name is Megan Sunderland. I'm with the Permanent Mission of Canada to the United Nations here in New York. And um, thanks very much for, uh, for the report. We are very pleased to see that it's out and hope that it makes its way across uh, many people's desks and tables in the, in the near future. I actually have several questions because so much has come out of this today. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'll sort of get them all out there and then and the two panelists can respond. Um, today in the news, we're hearing that Shireen Abadi, of course, is in Geneva right now and she has um, called for political sanctions. And I'd just be curious to know from the panelists um, what you think of this idea. Of course, we, we're expecting further sanctions to come from the Security Council in the next few weeks on the nuclear issue, and, and that is something completely separate. But I'm curious to know your views on this idea of political sanctions. Uh, I think um, many, uh, many would, would say that um, there's perhaps some, some benefit to this, but at the same time, is this only gonna create further accusations from the government of Iran of, of meddling and um, in what is a domestic matter, in their eyes, of course, and will this only um, hinder uh, any ability to have dialogue and, and have change? Um, the second question, actually, it comes from something that um, Ms. Sauter said about the use of courts in Europe and um, the US, and I just wonder if she could further elaborate on that um, in terms of addressing some of the violations that are going on. And then uh, my